originally was going to start the, the, the sermon with this little video. It's a 27 second video. And unfortunately, I forgot to bring it with me. But it's, it's a truck. You know, like, like my, my nephew's into these big raised trucks. So there's these two trucks and they put a rope or a chain between them and they're going to do a pull off to see which one's going to win, Ford or Chevy. And I don't remember which one won. So if you're a Ford guy, we'll just say your truck won. If you're a Chevy guy, the one on the left is the one that won. What happened is this rope is, is taken to this other truck and the one on the left pulls and it's moving it this way. And the other truck is trying to pull, trying to pull this way, but it just doesn't have the same traction and power. And then ultimately what happens is that truck gets pulled over the line and then that pulls the other truck apart. The whole cab comes off of it. And yeah. so you have to go to my Facebook page to see that video because it just doesn't do it justice for what I'm telling you about it. <laughs> so the, the title of this one today is Stop Counteracting Faith. You know, we have the ability to counteract faith. Do you guys get that? God can pour out everything to us. And he says, it's all as Suhad taught you guys a couple of weeks ago. It's all yours. It's all freely given to you by God. Amen. And we have the ability to now counteract what God has done because he doesn't force us to have it. So counteracting faith. The word counteract means to act against something in order to reduce its force or neutralize it. Just like that video I was telling you about, the one truck counteracted the other truck to the point of reducing its force because it pulled it the other way and then ultimately neutralizing it over the line and then, and then at the end of it, it actually destroyed that truck. So this is true both in the scene realm and in the spiritual realm. There, is, there are things that can counteract other things. What counteracts truth? Lies. Right. Lies. You know, I always found it curious, and I don't know where it is in the Proverbs. I think it's around 18, where God says, these six things I detest. And you would think, boy, I wonder what these six things are going to be. And he repeats one thing two times in that list. Do you know what that one thing he repeats two times is? Lies, a false word and a word uh, and, and a lie. He repeats it two times. He says, these are the things that I detest. But truth, here's the beauty of it, can counteract and does counteract a lie. That's why the truth will what? Set you free. So if the truth sets you free, what does a lie do? It binds us. It chains us. Suhad used the story this morning of an elephant and a rope, and you guys have probably seen the illustration. Just a, a tiny bit of background on that. What it does, what, what they do in training that elephant is at first they do, they put a big post with a big fat chain and ring around that elephant to train it to not go outside of that. And it pulls and it scuffs and it does everything it can to stop. But when it starts believing that it can't, they change it and then they actually can change it down to a small rope that could easily be broken and a simple little stake in the ground. Yeah, sure, the elephant can, but it doesn't believe it can. It believes a lie even though the truth is right there. It obeys the lie. It, 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 it does, it's blinded to the truth because it is trained. We have become so trained in this realm, we don't understand the supernatural anymore. And Christianity really is not supernatural in America. It's very logical. It's very analytical. It's very controlled. God has gotten to be in his box, and he's like the little genie that we need to rub every now and then to get out and to do what we need him to do. But if he doesn't, we'll still do it anyway. Right? We can, we can pretend to have the Spirit come by well-timed smoke machines and shows and all of the other stuff. Instead of just the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. We don't live. How much? Now think of your last week. How much of your week last week could you say is supernatural? Don't answer out loud. You don't have to answer it out loud. How much of it was above natural? Are you basically living in the natural all the time? And see, that's why the natural realm, when the storms come, as Suhad said earlier about the story of them in the boat, they were taken up by the things of the natural where Jesus was living in the supernatural. He was in supernatural rest. He was in a Sabbath. Think of that word Sabbath for a second. S-A-B-B-A-T-H. What is right in the middle of that word? Abba. Isn't it? He's taken up with Abba. He's at rest in Abba. 
And we can have that same supernatural experience in the midst of the storms, in the midst of everything going on. And it's available to us if we don't counteract faith. Now, there are many ways that we are counteracting faith that we don't even know. We're just blind to it. So I'm going to hopefully show you a couple little things today that may open your eyes so that you stop living just in the natural and live this supernatural life. Peter, in the natural, what did he do? Denied Jesus three times, even the last time cursing to a little slave girl, servant girl. But when the, when the Holy Spirit came upon him, what, did he do the same thing? No, he got up in front of 3,000 plus people at Pentecost. These were the people that were gathered at the temple, right? They were there to celebrate the giving of the law. These were very law-obeying, pious Jews. And what does Peter do? He says, you killed the Lord. Yep. Now repent. That's what he tells them. He, does, he doesn't shrink back anymore. Because he, he was now above the natural. This little slave girl wasn't going to kill him. But he was shrinking back to her because he was only focused on the things of the natural. Now we have the same thing. Now in truth, we are free. We are in the beloved. We are at rest in Abba right now. And the things of this world cannot touch us anymore unless they are filtered through God. And if they're filtered through what God allows, then we know it's for our good. Even Stephen, you guys know who Stephen is, the first martyr? Right? His face in the midst of it, what did it do? It shined, even in the midst of being stoned. Now, I can't imagine that. We sometimes gloss through passages. Stephen had an angry mob around him. They picked up, not, not little pebbles that you would get at the beach, but big stones. And they are stoning him. And yet his face shined because he wasn't living in the natural. He was so taken up with this Christ, with this who he truly is, with the Holy Spirit living in him. That's why Jesus could say at the end, after being beaten and whipped and going to his death, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Because he wasn't looking with natural eyes, but supernatural and that is the love of Christ living in us, this supernatural love. But yet, we can reject that. The word, or, or, or unbelieve it, really is a better way in the, in the scriptures. Or disobey what faith is teaching us. Do you guys realize that? We can be little disobedient children and disobey what faith is already saying. Our Father speaks to us and says, these are all freely yours, and we can just simply disobey Him and counteract that. Reject what He says. This is what the word reject means. It means to refuse, to accept, or believe. Therein, my act of unbelief, or my rejection of what God says, counteracts, neutralizes, and destroys my experience of what he wants to freely give me and what he has freely given me. So God is not at lack. I, 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 I chastised Suhad on Friday a little bit, but in a, a very, he told me never stop chastising and teaching him. But I, I said, and it wasn't in a mean way, but Suhad at the end of the class, he had spoken these beautiful things about what were freely given. And I sat at the class. You want to talk about a miracle? I was quiet through the whole class. That was a miracle, huh? That was living in the supernatural right there. See, so I had to have a supernatural week. But at the end of the class, and, and Suhad, and, and, and I've been where he's at. I'm, he's trying to get this through, and he's so energetic and enthusiastic. And of course, he's not given enough time to really go through this. At the end, he, he wants them to get it. And they're asking a few questions which are starting to negate it. And he gives them answers that, he, that they don't like. You go to the Holy Spirit and ask him. Don't ask me. I'm just a man. Go ask the Holy Spirit. Now, he had an answer for it. I mean, we, and, and, and other people in the class said, no, give him an answer. But Suhad refused to. So I was grateful for that for Suhad because we're so used. That's why I love the way that to Tozer used to end his sermons. He would say, that's all I can do for you. Now you go get with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Prayer room's open if you want to go or go home. That, I mean, what a great altar call that would be today. <laughs> We don't, it wasn't well-timed music. The first time I ever heard a Tozer sermon, I thought, oh, he's doing it wrong. That's, that's, not that we've done it wrong for all these years. First time I'm like, that's kind of rude. You go get with the Holy Spirit, and that's all I can do for you. 
filled me with the Holy Spirit. I love that. But at the end of it, Suhad prayed. Uh, he prayed, Lord, I would, uh, and he, this is basically what his prayer was. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would teach them uh, these things that, 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 that were spoken about today. Beautiful prayer, and this is what, what our desire is. But I told him, I said, you prayed amiss. You prayed amiss. Because now we put, the, put it on, back onto God. God, please teach them what, uh, what was just said. No, the Holy Spirit is always guiding and always teaching. I said, no, so next time let's put it back on them. Stop refusing what the Holy Spirit is teaching you. Stop looking to man to teach you. Stop looking to, to try to find it from a man and go to God. See, we put it back on God so many times instead of on us. God is pouring it out. It's already being poured out. Now, with that in mind and, and what counteracting means, let's look at John 3.36. I want to show you a verse. And if you have your Bible, great. If not, I'm going to put it up here. But you know what, guys? Bring your Bible so you can mark it up and put these things in here. Because as the Holy Spirit is giving you insights into the Word, you don't want to forget that. You either have a journal or a Bible or something. Because I'm telling you, if God is speaking, is it worth writing down? Is it worth remembering? Is it? Yeah. And if you're not, do you forget it? Because I have people say, I don't write. And I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, I'd go to teachings and I would, uh, oh, I just don't write things down. Well, honestly, I should have said, I forget a lot of what God has already taught me. And I got to relearn it the hard way over and over again. Because yeah. <laughs> that's the truth of it. So if God is teaching you something. Get Evernote for your phone. It's free. Probably put notes in Evernote. I don't care where you put them. But if God speaks something to you, write it down because it's worth remembering. He's training and teaching us. All right, so John 3.36, here's the verse. He who believes in the Son has, present tense, everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. Let me diagram what is happening here to kind of give us an understanding of how we can look at faith and unbelief counteracting faith. Faith, we know from the Scriptures, we've talked about this a number of times, faith comes from hearing what? Hearing the words, the rhema, the communication of God. Not the logos of God, not the, not the Bible. And, and again, as you read the logos, the, the Holy Spirit is, turns this into rhema for you. He turns it into Him communicating it. That's why this is a living book, not just a book. This book is alive because you now have a guide inside you that is teaching you this very word, this logic of God, the logos of God, the very Jesus. He's teaching you who He is. In his ways. So faith comes as you're sometimes as you're reading the word, sometimes as you're speaking to a brother, or sometimes as you're hearing a brother speak. Faith comes. Sometimes as you're driving a tractor through the field mowing the lawn, faith comes, right? It's, he's always available to speak. He's always speaking. God is always speaking if we have ears to hear. And faith is coming. Now let me just diagram this. Uh, Suhad so shared. 24 things last week, and I've got some more I want to add to that list. I got a few that I, th I thought about too. But, anyways, 24 things that are freely given to us by God. The first one on the list is by His blood we have the forgiveness of sins. Right? That's the first thing on, on that list. So, let me just diagram that. So, God is speaking that. Look, you have done, you've missed the mark over and over and over again. But I'm not holding that against you. On the cross, I've forgiven you of all of their sins. Now, now God is speaking to, the, to that to you directly. This is the initial salvation experience a lot of us have. Right? The Holy Spirit is convincing us of our unbelief. That's what John 16, 9 or 10 says. The Holy Spirit convinces and convicts us of our unbelief. Unbelief is a rejection, a pushing away of God. So the Holy Spirit is convicting us of this, and He usually does it normally through sin. We know we've missed the mark. We're holding on to guilt and shame and condemnation, and they're like a backpack. We can try to get away from them, and that's what we try to do in the natural realm. That's why we go to the spirits in the natural realm. We we'll drink, we we'll fun, we we'll go to anything that takes our mind off of that. There's everything to take our mind off of today. That's why silence is so, such a beautiful thing, because we begin to hear what God is saying in that silence. So faith is coming and, and, and the Lord is calling to each and every person. I want you. I've died for you. I, I forgive you. Come. Receive this forgiveness. Salvation is of me. That's that calling. Right? The Lord is called. He's invited. The word calling just means invited. He's invited each and every person in this world from prior to when we are here till after we'll be here to come to know Him. Faith comes. That is faith. 
If we misunderstand this process of salvation, we misunderstand what the relational aspect of the process of salvation is, and we make it a checklist to say, do you believe the same things about God that the devil believes? Do you believe that he, that he died? Yep, so does the devil. Do you believe that he was buried? Yep, so does the devil. Do you believe that he rose again? Yep, so does the devil. Okay, well then you're saved, just like the devil. No. That's called a devil's faith. We'll cover that, and I think we covered that in the past. That's why it's not a devil's faith. It's a relational response to God. That's what salvation is. You're coming to respond to God. So, you're going to take one of two paths. Because God is going to have each and every person respond to Him. You're going to take path A, which, leads, which, which ultimately will lead away from God, or path B. So God is calling. Each of us have this. Now, God called me many years before I actually was saved. And I didn't realize it. At the time, I did, because I just rejected and run, ran away from it. Charlie talks about it in his own life. Many times he knew God was calling him. Many times he was aware from both the outside hearing what was being said and the inside. Raising up, this is truth. Come to me. Now, what happens? There's either a relational, and all of it is relational because you have to actually say no to what God is saying here. That's why when, at the end of the time, you either have said yes or you have said no. Relational distrust, rejection, or neglect. We, we're good with the neglect thing because we don't feel like it's so much of a, of, of a rejection. But if my wife was coming up here, and she's not, and she wanted to give me this little tractor... Right, this little thing that my beautiful daughter made for me a number of years ago, because you know that's where the Ray really is, is driving that tractor. Right? If she wanted to give this to me, if I distrusted her, I would run away from her, because I would think it was a scorpion she was trying to give me, right? <laughs> if I rejected her, I'd say, no, daughter, sit down. That is not the perfect time to give me this, right? That's a rejection. Or a neglect would be, oh, that's interesting, and I turn away. The end result of that is the same thing, a pushing away, a not receiving. Wherein relational trust, which is what the word believe means in the Greek, it's pistio, and it means to entrust or to relationally trust and accept that this is truth. And when we accept truth, we're accepting a person. We're not just accepting a few logical responses to that. We're accepting the person. That's why he is the way, the truth, and the life. We, re we receive Him. Now, let's keep going down the path. Because what happens next on, these, on the gray side here? Well, we see from the verse that they continue abiding in wrath. God's wrath is upon their minds, upon their heads still. Now, they can do anything they want, but they are not living life. And never, 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 never look at those that have more money or more opportunities out there to, to, to do things that they got it all together. They don't. I, I, told the, I told the group on Friday, actually Suhad told the group Friday, he said, David and I are the richest men in this room. And uh, we are not financially in the bank accounts the richest men in that room. But when you understand what, all that we have in Christ, you're the richest wherever you are. But see, we think so many times that because of great vacations or bigger cars or bigger houses, that that, that is what brings real life. It's a lie in the natural and we believe that lie because we've succumbed to it by watching it on TV, by looking at other people. We buy the masks that they're wearing. That's why he says, stay away from the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is just a lie. It's wearing a mask when they're really dying inside. I had one guy that was a, a, a friend of mine. He was a, um, a, somebody, a yacht mechanic. And when they first, he would, he would tell me this, I sold him some property a number of years ago, he, he would say, when you first meet the people that own these big, and he's not talking about the, you know, a 30-foot boat, he's talking about like a 90-foot yacht, million-dollar boats. So he's not coming there for a few hours to, to repair a starter. He's there for a few days to repair whatever needs to be repaired. He says, when you first meet them, they look like they got it all together. And, and this is so cool how God, now this was a conversation I had back in... 06, and how God quickens these conversations. This is eight years ago. He says, yeah, when you first meet them, they look like they got it all together. But he says, after they forget I'm there, the venom comes out. Because they hate each other. They're just, they're in this continual butting of heads. And, and he says, it's just really ugly. He says, the most unhappy people I've ever met are those that have it all and found out that it is not satisfying. I think sometimes the, the people that live in the, in the gated communities that, that look like they have it all together, and they're so good at wearing the mask, aren't they? Wherein the people that are, that are in the inner cities, they don't wear the mask. 
But see, they still have more hope than the people in the gated communities. You know that? Because at least they still have the hope that money will bring them happiness. Money will bring them satisfaction. Big rims and, and all the other things can bring, bring, bring an identity where the other people know that it doesn't work, so we're just going to have to pretend that it did work until we, until we die and we get to now get to heaven. And then we buy the lie over and over. So those is still abiding in wrath. They're lost. They're living in death. When you relationally trust and you've accepted this faith that comes from God and now you're in this, this union with God, there becomes an abiding in Christ. That's why he says the result of that, he who believes into the Son, that word on or in, is not the proper definition, it's into, back in that John 3.36 verse. He who believes into the Son, is that abiding in Christ? That's eternal life. Because the Son is eternal. It's not like God zaps you down from heaven and says, Pew! Martha, now you have eternal life. He's not like Shazam in it. You know what I mean? And not got his holsters out and he's saying, well, she said the prayer, right? Bang, you got eternal life. You get to be with me in heaven. No, eternal life is God is eternal. He's the one that has Zoe life. And his spirit and your spirit become one. Because you are now one, that is what eternal life is. Oneness with God. Anything apart from that is not eternal life. If you describe eternal life any other way, you don't even understand what eternal life is. That is eternal life. Oneness with God. That's why he says abiding in him. And that word abiding just means re remaining or living in. Now what happens next? Yeah, thank you, brother. As you, as you moved away from God, you're now abiding in wrath. That wrath is to lead you back to life. God, it's like, it's like pain many times. You put your hand on the stove. It's not for you to keep it there and to try to figure out how to live with that pain on the stove. It's that pain happens because you say, oh, there's something wrong. But in our pride, we've got it still together. We don't realize. We try to say there, like, we're pretty happy right now. You know, our skin is being singed and we're burning. But hey, let me show you the right way to life. No, we're dying inside. And it's meant to lead you back to Christ. God has given it to you for a reason. When the red lights come on, it's for a reason. All right? Ultimately, the result is hell. It's a separation. You're living in separation of God anyway. What is he going to do in the end? Is he going to give you all this time where he's calling you? It's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I'm off of my script now totally. <laughs> Because, I, I mean, I have gotten to be so much, when, when you're watching things on the internet, there's, there's this bait that's out there called inclusionism, and there's a lot of isms that it's called. But ultimately, one of the lies of it is, well, you know, there really is no hell. God will reconcile all people later. He's just kind of giving you a little extra time. It's kind of like the evolution people, in a way. Well, you know, just enough time, and then things will change. That's why when evolution started, it was millions of years, and then it became billions of years. It just really, when they, when they figured out the, the, the thing with millions of years wouldn't work, they had to go to billions of years. So when inclusionism says, well, you know, we really just didn't, God didn't have enough time. Like, God's not efficient enough to get his message through to, to the heart of people in 80 years. It's ridiculous. Ultimately, they're living in hell apart from God. What is God going to do at the end of it now? All right, I'll force you into heaven. I'll force you into relationship. That's not our God. Our God is a gentleman. He knocks at the door and, fight and, and says, I want to come in. Will you invite me in? Just like in your marriage. If your marriage is going through trials, God is not going to force his way in there. The results of things that are, that are in trials are you to come back, you and your husband, to come back to God and say, God, what is going on here? We need you. We're missing the mark somewhere open up our eyes, but we try to figure it out apart from God, and we ultimately live that part in hell. And then ultimately heaven is the abode, if, if heaven is the abode of God, think about this, this is a very logical thing, if heaven is the abode of God, and you are in union with God, where will you ultimately go? Yeah, and because eternal life starts the moment that you receive this person, you are already seated in the heavenlies, as Ephesians says. Right? I am already living in the heavenlies. Now, I live in this temporal realm that is still being beaten up by sin and by, by lies and all kinds of things, but I live in heaven because that is where I abide, is in heaven. Now, again, if we go back to that verse, that word unbelief, and this is in the ESV, whoever does not obey the Son. In the other version it said, and, and I like this other version, it's the New King James, it says, who does not believe the Son does not believe the Son. I like that because at least it gets the relational aspect of it. 
This one says, who does not obey the Son. Ultimately, we are going to have something happen. We are either going to obey or to reject. We're either going to obey what the Son has said. And obedience is not a checklist. It means hearken attentively, is what the Greek word means. It's hupakaya, right? We, we talked about this before. It means to hearken attentively to what the Son is. As I agree with Him, I begin now abiding in Him. So faith comes from God to each and every person. There's a time and a place when the heart is open to see. And that, that is the invitation that God gives. The means of faith is us hearing God. And at that very point, there's a response that is made. Either obedience to faith. And if you look in the book of Romans, it starts off with obedience to faith and ends with obedience to faith. There's either an obedience to faith or a disobedience does not obey faith. That is why some translate uh, John 3, or 3.36 in this way. And, it, and I'll show you this again. Whoever believes into, that's what the word there is, it is, is ice, E-I-S. It's into the sun. But I think for the translators it didn't make sense, so they put in. Where, where there is a Greek word in, it's E-N. This, but this word is not in, it's into, which is E-I-S in the Greek. Whoever believes into the Son has eternal life. You see, that makes great sense for us. But for some reason they, they translate it in this manner. And then we've turned this, and the enemy is working with it to turn this into just an intellectual ascent to a few facts about God. It doesn't mean that. It means believing into Him. I believe, yes, I don't give Him my life. I receive His life, and now we have new life together. That's what new creation is. So let me show you another diagram that I think may help bring this out. Because this is the counteracting. God, faith comes by hearing, hearing Him. Again, we're talking about the blood of Christ and salvation still, right? And I'm either going to believe, which is to activate, relationally trust what He has said, or I'm going to believe not, which is also disobey, and actively reject or neglect what God has said. Quote that, that many have found helpful, including me, when it comes to the heaven and hell and the purpose of God is a C.S. Lewis quote. And this is what C.S. Lewis said. He says, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. Now that's a little brain teaser there for a minute, isn't it? So we are either going to say, God, yes, your will be done. Or God's going to say, no, you're, go ahead, your will be done. If you don't want me... I will not push myself upon you. Without the self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. Those who knock, it is open to. And although the primary means that God uses to get the gospel out to people is, is, is in tracts and in the preaching of the gospel, there are two witnesses always. There's the witness of the word going out and the witness of the word from within. God always does things in two witnesses. So that, that way nobody is without excuse. You see that in Romans 1. I'll show you the verse in one second. But Romans 1.21 says, for they were without excuse. So there's the witness of both the preaching of the gospel. And this is why like, there's areas where the gospel can't get into. Right now in our, in, in our history, we've, we've got a really neat thing going on with um, the Muslim community. God is sending them dreams of Jesus. He is getting the gospel through to them. There's visions that are happening of the, what the gospel is. And people are being saved. And they're receiving Christ. And they're seeing this. It, maybe it's a place where, the, where the, it's called the 1040 window, where, the, where they, the gospel generally doesn't get into. So God himself is bringing it to them in visions. And there's an internal witness of, yes, that vision is true. There's the two witnesses. Just like if I was preaching to somebody and then there's an internal witness of them saying, yes, what he is saying is true. Will you receive me? I'm knocking at the door of your heart. Will you come and know me? See, we see this in Romans 1. For what can be known about God is plain to them because Dave has a perfectly well-crafted um, track that, that lays out the plan of salvation perfectly. Right? Because the four spiritual laws were given to them at a minute, and even though they're the four spiritual flaws, they, they received them, they accepted them, and they became good church members the rest of their life. No, because God himself has shown it to them. So that's why each man can be without an excuse. God doesn't need more time. God has plainly shown the gospel to each and every person. We, we put it back on God so much, instead of putting it on people to respond to what God is teaching them. 
And this is just one point that we're taking on, on Suhad's 24. It could be, you know, this, you know, you remember what the second thing is on there? On the second thing on his list other than Suhad? Does anybody remember it? Just as a pop quiz time. Yeah. The second thing. Anybody remember the second thing? It was only a couple weeks ago. Judy, you've heard it about 75 times. Yeah. I'm not going to call you out. The second thing is by... Because, <laughs> Judy's got notes, see? That's right. Because of the body of Christ, by his body, his body being broken, we are healed. Well, the natural realm doesn't say that. It look, doesn't seem like that. So therefore, I'm going to obey what's in the natural instead of what's in the supernatural. So then we give obedience to sickness. We give obedience to what is foreign to the, for the child of God instead of what is true and what God has given us. Now, each one of those things can be looked at in the same way. So the, the, the counteracting thing is we go back to this. Now, this is a good one for salvation, but it's the same thing for healing. This is why I'd never have anybody pray over me that doesn't believe that it's God's will to heal me every time. Never. I, I don't want them. Because if they believe, first of all, if they believe sickness comes from God, then don't ever pray for it. Oh, God, no. We're moving the podium again. We're not going to make it through this one today because let me just tell you this. If you believe that sickness comes from God, you better pray for more and more sickness. <laughs> and if you're sick, don't ask somebody to pray against that sickness because you believe God gave it to you for your good. That's the lie that we begin to swallow. Where God, does. How many times did Jesus come and be like, hmm, that's very interesting. I'm going to put a little sickness on you. How many times did he do that with people? He didn't even do that with the Pharisees, and they were a brood of vipers. He should have, yeah. If I was Jesus, I'd be casting out sickness all over. No, Jesus didn't do that. But how many times when people came to Christ, did he heal them? Did he do it? Let me give you a multiple choice, A, B, or C. Every time, sometimes, or never? A, B, or C. What do you guys think? Every time, sometimes, or never? A, every time. Every time the person came to Christ, they were healed. He went about healing the multitudes. Is it God's will for your healing? Look into Jesus. If you don't understand, look to Jesus. Look at what his will was. He said he did everything that the Father was doing. He said what he saw the, what he saw the Father saying, what he heard the Father saying. He always did what the Father's will is. The Father's will is for you to be healed. You've got to get that settled in your spirit before you can even go to belief or unbelief. Because if you're not sure... Then, then you might as well think sickness is of God. And if you think that, well, in the worst prayer, the worst prayer, and I prayed it for the longest time, so I'm guilty here. Father, we pray, and it's, you know, I, we always had to do it in this voice, too, that, that, at least at the church. <laughs> we had to do it in that voice. I don't know why. Because <laughs> it sounded very good. <laughs> Lord, we know that, that, that Brother Brian is sick right now. And Father, we want you to heal him. But if it's not your will to heal him, Father, we don't want to pray against your will. So that, Father, either way, your will be done. I mean, that is the definition of a double-minded prayer. It's, it's, you might have just cut the tongue out and be like, that's the stupid. That's got to be one of the stupidest prayers I've ever said. And I said it over and over again with that voice of looking very superior and saying it. It sounded very good. At least Brother Brian got to hear my voice for a little while. All right, let me go back. Let's get back on track. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God himself has shown it to them. Each man is without excuse. There, every person that is in hell is the ones that will say, not your will be done, God, but my will. And God says, okay, your will be done. You can be away from me. I'm not going to force you into relationship. And if God has shown it to them, no one has an excuse to distrust the gospel message because God gets the perfect gospel message every time through. Does he not? So we can't put it back on man. Well, because, you know, you didn't hear the right message. We become so humanistic with our, thing, with our means, not trusting that God can get the perfect gospel message to the open heart at the right moment. And then they either will trust that or not trust that. But, sadly, we know that there are many people that would rather live in darkness than in light. And this is what Jesus said. After that John 3.16 verse, I almost think that John 3.16 is beautiful of a sum up of the gospel it is. You, you miss the point unless you hear 17 through 19. For God did not send Jesus into this world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
Whoever believes into him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed into the name of the one and only Son of God. And this is the judgment, or this is the, let me sum it up as he's saying right here. The light has come into this world. Remember, Jesus is the light of this world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. They would rather have their own works than have the very God that created them. And they take the lie and they believe it that, that, that God is not the author of joy but the cosmic killjoy. I believed that lie for way too long. I empowered that lie. And that lie then led, me to, that led to steal the truth. But thank God he does get through and at the right time because it's God's desire that all people come to him. It's why he created each of us. It's to know him and to be fully known by him. He's not condemning us. If he's not condemning us here, just another little side note, we'll go on for a second. If he's not condemning us here in our worst day, why would he be condemning us as sons and daughters of the Most High? Hi guys, thanks for watching these videos. I hope that they are a blessing to you and are feeding you with the true Word of God. One that's not a mixture of the Old Covenant, New Covenant together, where neither make any sense or they both become obsolete, but one where it rightly divides the Word of Truth. And I pray that they're not only feeding you, but feeding others in your life, within your family's life. Pray more that the peace and love of God is shown and, and manifest and made real in your lives as you watch these videos. And as you understand how wildly affectionate and crazy God is about you. And let it live out of the abundance of His divine nature. Guys, if these videos are being a blessing to you and you want to help support them and help support all the things that we're doing at A Grace Place, well, I would ask that you would go to www.agpchurch.com. There's a giving button at the top right, and you can go there and you can give via PayPal. You can give through e-giving. You can even become a monthly contributor or weekly contributor. If you don't have a home church and this has become your home church in many ways, then please feel free to sow into this. One thing that we do differently is our finances are an open book. So if you want to look at what we're doing with our financials, there's ways to get our financials. and You can see what goes where. You can't see who gives what. Nope, 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 we're not doing that. But you can see where the money actually goes out. And it's our desire not to only have this community of grace believers here locally, but to bring the good message of the happy God out. And guys, that's what you're participating with when you sow into this. So I would ask that, that, that you would give by faith. Remember, faith comes by hearing, hearing the words of God. So let God instruct you where to sow this money into. The money that He so abundantly bless you with. Remember, you're just stewards of it. It's His money. And if this is one of the places He wants you to do so, then I would say go to our website and click on that giving tab. But do so prayerfully and do so being led by God. Not out of compulsion, but being led by Him to give the good gifts so that others may come into this union life, so that others may know what it means to live in the grace and goodness of God. Be blessed, and here is the rest of the video. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn you, but to save you. Now we think, well, we become sons and daughters of God. Of course he's going to condemn us now. And we live under another live condemnation where Paul had to squash that lie and say, hey, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. God's not coming to condemn you, but to save you. It's God's desire that each of us make a decision for Him or against Him. And that's ultimately what happens. We, everybody in this time and space is making a decision, each breath, each moment, for or against God. Because we see God's desire. The Lord's not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He's patient with you, Dave Geisler, with you, Dwayne Parker. Even if He's got to get you right to the end of where you are, He's patient with you. He's not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. Hallelujah. The repentance there is a change of understanding, a change of mind of who He is, a change of will and a change of direction. I'm now, instead of running away from God, I'm running towards God every step of the way. Because He's not evil. He's good. That's why these lies always go against the character of God and help us to run away from God Himself. Now, this is the same for victory or any other thing. I'll give you a little glimpse into part of my thing. Is I didn't realize part of the finished work of Christ is that He made me holy. 
because I bought the lie that by my actions I could be holy. But God had already called me holy. So I was trying to do something that he was saying, no, no, you already are. I was trying to become something I already was. Or as Watchman Nee would say, it, I was trying to enter a room I was already in. So for years I lived under that and I was wondering why it didn't work out. Why I never felt holy enough because I was working actually against God. I was, I was empowering the lie that I wasn't holy, that I wasn't set apart for God, which is really what the word holy means, and that I needed to do something to make myself appropriate and holy for God. And yet, what is one of the worst churches that we see in all of the New Testament? The Corinthian church. If there was any church that wasn't holy, it was the Corinthian church. They, would, they were bragging about their unholiness. right? They were bragging about all of their fleshly activities. But what does Paul call them? Look in the, this is right in the beginning. Uh, sometimes we put greetings at the end of letters. right? Paul puts a greeting in the beginning and the end of the letter. So this is, he says, and this is in the King James, and I'll show you why for a reason. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified, notice that's a past tense thing, in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, if you don't know how to read your Bible, which I didn't for the longest time, and now the new versions don't even do this, but look at what it says, called to be saints. All right, well, I'm, gonna, I'm called to be a saint. I'm invited to be a saint. So that means it's up to my ability. I've got to be a saint. I've got to really be, I've I, I got to do what, i, I just got I, I to work up and be holy. Because that's what the word saints means. It's the word hagios, same word as holy, right? But notice, if you just look a little bit, and if you have a King James, you'll see this in your Bible, where the word to be, just kind of tilted a little bit. It's tilted. Some of the, uh, so I think the NASB still does this too. A few Bibles do this. Why is it tilted? It's added. Because it just didn't make sense for the translator to say, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints. You're already called saints. And if God calls you, you, you don't need to uncall yourself something. That word to be is not even there. I just strike it right out of your Bible. Because the translators put it there to help you understand that you need to be more saintly. That's why even the, in the King James, the translators put um, at the end of, for there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, right? That Romans 8.1. Then they add a little bit on the end of that, which is not there either. So you always look at these italics as you're like, well, oh, it's not there. You already are. You're not trying to enter a room you're already in. Because he defines us by what we are, not what we do. That's one that you guys need to write down. Yes. He defines us by what we are, not what we do. He defines us by what he says we are, who he says we are, not by what we do. I mean, my son can come in here and get on all fours and start to bark like a dog. I'm not going to say, well, I guess he's turned into Sasha, which is our dog's name. <laughs> well, I guess we got a third dog now. Great. <laughs> he's acting like a dog. He must be a dog. <laughs> No, what am I going to do? I'm going to kick him in the butt and I'm going to say, get up, son. Get up. Stop acting like a dog. Do you think that's what God does to us? Come on, Dave. You're, you're holy. You're mine. You don't need to act like this. This is not who you are. But see, we, we, we tend to define ourselves by what we do instead of who we are. I'm an accountant. I'm a dance teacher. I'm a... Good-looking man that preaches the gospel. I don't know. Whatever you want to say, you can define yourself by what you are. <laughs> those are good lies. I like this. <laughs> so for seven years of my Christian life, I was trying to become holy by my works. I was trying to be what I already, what God had already said I was. And that's why the end of the, the whole thing was me throwing the Bible across the room saying, I can't do it. And God's saying, good, you finally get it. You can't, but I can, and I have, and I'm in you, and I'm holy, and therefore you are holy. Thank God for stop trying to be something you already are. Let me live my life in you and through you now. Because I was walking in opposition to God, which is essentially what I was doing. It could never, 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 never work. Even as hard as I tried, even as, as, as true as I was trying to do it, it could never, never, never work. God had tried. And then I had to either live in hypocrisy. I had to make a decision, too, at that moment. Because I was living in hypocrisy for the longest time. Yes, it's working, brothers. We're, we're all holy here. We struggle from time to time. But not like those heathen at the bar over there. They're really struggling. 
And that's how kind of we would do it. And we all knew that we were struggling with the same thing, but we would never really say, and we were just kind of, yes, all men of God struggle. It's a spiritual battle. No, it's because I'm battling against God. Is what it was. It wasn't the enemy. He didn't need me to do it. The enemy got me on the track to battle against God, and then I was battling against God because I wouldn't receive what he said. In fact, by my very, in the, the traditions of that denomination of the time, this is still taught. Still taught within there. And it's the same thing that happened in Jesus' day where they nullified the Word of God by their traditions. Don't you think that a lot of that is happening today? I'll show you the verse. Nullifying the Word of God by your tradition you have handed down. This is what Jesus told the Pharisees. We're still doing it today. We're still doing it today. We are, God says we're one in Christ. All those that are His are one together, and yet... We have denominations over and over and over places to, to separate us into perfectly packaged little Christians that believe certain things instead of the body looking as one. And yet God said, hey, the world will know that you're my disciples by the love that you have and the unity that you have. But yet, I, And I told a guy this that goes to a denominational church, and I said, you know, one of the things that would make a statement at your church for you, after I was showing them all these things about denominations, is if you took this yellow sledgehammer that I had in my truck, and I said, you went out and knocked the denomination out of your sign. I said, that would probably get their attention. And they say, this is not God's will for us to be a denomination. No, we've got to fall into line. See, <laughs> nullifying the word of God, God, this is, listen to this, it nullifies the Word of God because God says we are one. Denominations say we're not. We're separate. We're the, we're the Baptists. We're the Methodists. We're the, we're the Pentecostals. We're the, and let me tell you guys, in grace it gets this way too. We're the exchange life. We're this. Now there's all this other. We're the inclusionist exchange life. We're the radical grace exchange life. We're this exchange life. Guys, we are one in Christ. Stop it. And you know what? The beauty is, just like... <laughs> Just like we wouldn't say, no, we're a white church. Can you imagine that? Can you, even though there are churches that in a de facto way already do that, well, we're a white church only. Is that not separating yourself out when God says there's not, there's not black or white, not Jew or Gentile, not male or female? We're a male church only here. We can only have men come to this church. <laughs> Just say stupid. And yet we buy the stupid things and thus nullify the Word of God because of our traditions that at least keep us comfortable, put a little springs on our wagon until we get to heaven. And then God, of course, will say, well done, good and faithful servant, because we've done right by Him. We've separated ourselves from those other people, from those Methodists. How dare those Methodists come in with their methodology? How dare those Baptists come in with water immersion baptism? Of course we need to separate. You sprinkle here, you baptize deep in the water here. We can't be one. And the world looks on and says, man, I got a lot enough disunity in my life. I don't need any more of that disunity. That stuff is crazy. Y'all people crazy. That's, that, was, that's what I, that was kind of my thing with the Christianity. Y'all people crazy. Uh, so I put my hope in what I was taught about God instead of realizing that God himself was my only true teacher. I put my, let me repeat that I, I put my hope in what I was taught about God by men instead of realizing that God himself was my only true teacher. That's why every week, and I forgot to remind you this week, so I'll remind you right now, hear and listen to what I'm saying, but hear what the Spirit has to say to you. Because see, the Holy Spirit's able to get through a message to you in your life. It's usually one, maybe two things that come throughout the sermon when you think, man, that whole sermon is talking to me. There's something in there that the Holy Spirit is getting through to you. There's an attitude. There's an action that needs to be taken. The Holy Spirit is teaching you. It's my job to help you to, to unveil these things, to encourage you, to show you these things. But it's His job to truly teach you. And that's why when John, who was writing the letter, and 1 John is a letter of teaching towards the church, but this is what he puts within the letter. He says, as for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you. Basically, that means that God's very Holy Spirit is abiding in you. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you, as his Holy Spirit teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it is, has taught you, you abide in him. See, the Holy Spirit is teaching each and every person in here. 
My question is, will you have ears to hear what he is teaching you? He's inviting you to understand and to know and to experience more of Christ today, more of God today, and to walk in that. Now let me show you one last example, and I'll end on this one, about how unbelief counteracts faith. Unbelief is the counteracting to faith. Watch what he says here in Hebrews 3.15. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. See, there is a response. If you hear his voice today, there's a response that's going to happen. You are either going to say yes and soften your heart to God, or you are going to harden your heart. That, that clay becomes harder and harder. Just think of Pharaoh, right? Four times, Pharaoh hardened his heart towards God. Pharaoh hardened his heart towards God. Pharaoh hardened his heart towards God. So today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? Now he's saying, look, those are all the ones that believed that, that, they, that they were Jews, that were coming out to worship. And with whom did he, was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who missed the mark, who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were Believing not is the King James or to disobedient. That's, that's the verb right there. And then we see there's another word used in the next verse. So we see that they were unable to enter because of noun, unbelief. So unbelief is the condition of disobedience of faith. So that's the condition that you find yourself in. You cannot believe. Those, look at 319 again. So we see that they were unable, not able, they, they couldn't. They'd already been disobedient to faith. They've already been over and over hardening their hearts in the rebellion, trusting in the natural. Let me give you a quick example of what was happening here. Uh, I can give you a number of examples in this, but they sent 12 spies over to the promised land. Joshua and Caleb said, let's go. God said we can take them. We're, we're going. Let's go. Load up. Come on, guys. Let's go. Let's roll. And they look back and there's 10 guys standing there saying, well, you know, we're kind of small. We're a little puny. And Joshua and Caleb said, no, no, God said we can. This is, our, this is our land. Let's go. Well, you know what? And then the other people started to hear them. And they started to lead this rebellion. Well, you know what? We're, we're kind of like grasshoppers, actually. We're, see, they're real big, and we're like a little grasshopper. But where was their focus? Natural. Where was Joshua and Caleb's focus? Supernatural. God said, let's go. I trust what God has said. Now... Again, taking Sue Hodge 24 things or any promise of the Bible, are you going to trust what God has said? Are you going to now walk out of here in the supernatural power, the same power, the scripture says, that raised Jesus from the dead? That's, pretty, that's a lot of power, isn't it? Would you say, hmm, that's probably more power than my iPod has. But the same power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead now abides in you. But see, we put it back on God. Well, God, I just don't know, Lord, you don't want me to, you know. We, we, we shrink back so many times instead of moving forward. We have the very power and love of God now living in us to live these supernatural lives. I, I, there's a church over across the way from me. I'm friends with the pastor over there at uh, Kingdom Life. And they're beginning to unravel this whole thing on healing. And they're believing God on this healing. They're seeing miracles happen over there because of healing. Miracles. Are we not seeing that in our life? Is it because there's unbelief stealing the faith and trust of what God has said? It is ours. It is ours. May we receive freely the things that have been freely given us, and may we walk out in that same power that raised Christ from the dead as we walk out the doors today. Remember when I said this before, when you enter the room, God enters the room. We don't ask God to come into the room because He abides in us, and when we enter the room... God invite his, his power and His light enter each and every room, whether it's in your workplace, uh, whether it's in, 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 in your family. It doesn't matter. God's very power. But we focus on the things of the natural, just like the disciples did when the storms got going. They focused on the things of the natural. Guys, we don't have to take that trick anymore. We don't have to abide by that lie. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus already. Think about that 
ponder that. You already are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Victory is yours. It's not something you go to work for. It's something you work from. I'm already victorious in everything that I'm doing. And now that same power that abides in us goes out and manifests the power of God's light, makes it real to other people. May we continue to walk in that this week. In Jesus' name. We are here Because of grace Because of